everyone. We'll be getting starting. The Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on seven National Park Service bills. Under Committee Rule 4, subparagraph F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or at the close of this hearing, whichever comes first. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. I also ask unanimous consent that Representatives A. Donald McEachin, Pete Stauber, and Garrett Graves join the hearing to ask questions of the witnesses. Hearing no objection, so ordered. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at HNRC at, or hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Uh, and additionally, please note that members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our fully in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff uh, as soon as practical. I'll now uh, proceed with recognizing myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you uh, to the members and the witnesses for joining us today for a subcommittee on national parks, forests, and public lands legislative hearing. I'd first like to extend my gratitude to the colleagues who have sponsored these bills as well as today's witnesses for their testimony. Last week, we, were, we marked both Earth Day and National Park Week, so it is only fitting that we contemplate a range of bills today that demonstrate the many values preserved within our national parks. Sounds as though uh, someone online might need to mute their microphone if they could. Just give a moment. All right, thank you. National parks protect the crown jewels of the cultural and natural world. Our most pristine wilderness, our most iconic landscapes, and our most cherished and revered stories. All of this is made possible by the hard work and ingenuity of the National Park Service. The agency has a broad portfolio that ranges from managing visitation to providing vital technical and financial support that ensures the preservation of historic resources. But with this broad portfolio comes related challenges. Americans love their parks, indicated by rising visitation and popularity over the last several years, but this increased interest has brought overcrowding, site maintenance issues, and other management challenges to the forefront. And that's why we're committed to providing the National Park Service with the resources necessary to manage these special places. The fiscal year 22 omnibus appropriations law that Congress passed earlier this year provided the agency with a nearly 5% increase in overall funding. Last year's bipartisan infrastructure law provided $1.7 billion to improve roads and bridges, update and upgrade transportation systems, and support climate resilient infrastructure projects. And the House, uh, as we all know, passed Build Back Better, uh, the act last year that included $1 billion for new rangers and staff across the national park system, funding that we certainly hope to 
see included in a future legislative vehicle. As America's national parks continue to rise in popularity, we have to continue investing in their long-term management and sustainability. Uh, while we recognize these needs and these challenges, we have to continue to also work to ensure that our parks continue to tell America's story. Uh, just this week, uh, we sent a bill to expand the Brown v. Board National Historical Park to President Biden's desk for his signature. I'm grateful to many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who supported that effort. Today, we'll consider H.R. 6805, the African-American Burial Grounds Preservation Act, which is introduced by Representative Adams of North Carolina and would establish a grant program within the Department of Interior to support the preservation, maintenance, and upkeep of historic African-American burial grounds, many of which have been lost and neglected over time. I'm glad that we'll also consider uh, my bipartisan legislation, H.R. 7218, the Colorado National Heritage Areas Reauthorization Act, which would reauthorize Colorado's three heritage areas, including uh, the Cache Lapooter uh, National Heritage Area, which is in my district and my community in Larimer County. I look forward to hearing testimony from Ms. Uh, Sabrina Stoker in just a bit, who is joining us today from the Pooter Heritage Alliance. We'll also consider H.R. 6589, the Historic Preservation Fund Enhancement Act, introduced by the Subcommittee for the Indigenous People of the United States Chairwoman, a distinguished uh, a gentleman from New Mexico, Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Since it was established in 1966, the Historic Preservation Fund has become a critical tool to protect historic resources. Uh, and we are very grateful uh, for uh, uh, Chairwoman Ledger Fernandez's leadership in introducing H.R. 6589, which would permanently authorize and double the amount of available funding uh, for this work. We also will review two bills that allow us to consider one of the critical issues facing uh, our country and the global community today, which is the, the crisis uh, and the war in Ukraine. H.R. 7075, the Ukrainian Independence Park Act, introduced by Representative Sparts of Indiana, a Republican member, would designate a parcel of federal land in Washington, D.C. as the Ukrainian Independence Park. Representative Sparts was born in what is now Ukraine and is the first Ukrainian-born woman to ever serve in the United States Congress. I want to thank her for her work on this important issue, and I'd express my sincerest support for the people of Ukraine. I don't know my colleagues who join me in that as well. The symbol of solidarity does not ease the horrors being inflicted right now on Ukraine uh, by Putin's barbaric war, but it is nonetheless an important gesture that speaks to the power of parks. With that, I will yield back the balance of my time and recognize the ranking member for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman DeGoose. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses and discussing the legislation before us today, but there is an elephant in the room, not on our agenda, which is related to the subject matter at hand and that's astronomical gas prices and a dramatic increase in inflation. Some of the legislation before us today would spend billions of new dollars that we just don't have. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act would create a, up to 2.7 billion in new mandatory spending over the next 10 years. Millions of Americans across the country are struggling fiscally just to get by, and those struggles are only exacerbated by exorbitant spending practices. According to the AAA, the national average for a gallon of gas is $4.12. Couple this with the 8.5% inflation we've seen over the past 12 months, the highest since 1981, and a national debt surpassing $30 trillion. And it's clear that the last thing we should do is create a $300 million in new mandatory spending every year in perpetuity. What's especially concerning about the situation that we are considering the reauthorization of the Historic Preservation Fund while simultaneously attacking the very energy revenues that fund it. Since taking office, the Biden administration has done everything in its power to delay and prevent domestic energy production. Almost immediately after taking office, the president placed a moratorium on oil and gas leasing on federal lands and on waters. Although this moratorium was blocked by injunction last June, the Biden administration spent months delaying the lease process, which resulted in a chilling effect across the domestic energy production industry. The Department of Interior held one offshore lease sale in November of 21, but a district court vacated the lease sale in January of 22 in an unprecedented decision. The administration chose not to appeal the case, astonishingly declining to defend its own work. Since that time, 
no new leases have been issued for the sale. In addition, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has not scheduled the three remaining sales under the current five-year plan for offshore leasing and is rapidly running out of time to do so. Despite repeated congressional requests for information, the Department of Interior has not provided any information when the agency will publish the next five-year plan. This has created uncertainty for American businesses, offshore oil and gas development, energy security, and conservation programs like the Historic Preservation Fund. If the administration was interested in more than just rhetoric, they would roll back the red tape they have put in place that stymates sustainable energy production on federal lands and waters. This is the only way to ensure the long-term solvency of the Historic Preservation Fund, which they claim to care so much about. In contrast to the administration's policies, committee Republicans have introduced a suite of bills to show America's desire to, to reduce dependence on countries like Russia. This includes two bills I'm co-sponsoring, the American Energy Independence from Russia Act and the No Timber from Tyrants Act. Both would not only improve our national security and that of our allies, but also create jobs at home by increasing American energy and timber production. The suite of Republican-led efforts also includes two bills we will be considering today, and thank you for that, which will show our solidarity with the, solidarity with the people of Ukraine as they face Putin's unhinged rampage. First, Representative Wagner's bipartisan bill to authorize the Secretary of the Interior to light up the Gateway Arch in St. Louis in the colors of the Ukrainian flag. And second, as mentioned by the Chairman, Representative Sparts' bill to formally name a small park in Washington, D.C. as Ukrainian Independence Park. Yes, Representative Sparts is the only Ukrainian-born member of Congress and has been a real champion of this legislation, and I thank her for her leadership during this incredibly trying time. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, now I'd like to turn to our witnesses. Um, All right, my apologies, just getting caught up here. Uh, I'd like to turn to the witnesses. Uh, before introducing them, I'll remind non-administration witnesses that they are encouraged to participate in the Witness Diversity Survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation materials for further information. Uh, let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five, five minutes, but that their entire statements will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin. The lights in front of you will turn yellow when there is one minute left and then red when the time has expired for any members and witnesses joining remotely. Uh, it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. And I recommend that you pin the timer so that it remains visible. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. And I'll also allow the entire panel to testify before questioning the witnesses. So. With that, the chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from California, Mr. Desane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you for your good work and for allowing me to pre present uh, the National Discovery Trails Act, H.R. 4878. Uh, this bipartisan legislation would achieve two longstanding goals first identified in the 1994 National Parks Service Study to create a new category of national trail known as the National Discovery Trail and to make the existing American Discovery Trail an official part of the national trail system. This bill would help to connect wilderness areas and national parks with rural towns and big cities alike in an effort to promote family-oriented recreation, physical health, and economic development. The American Discovery Trail, sometimes known as ADT, already exists and is joy enjoyed by hikers, bikers, hey, and walkers every day. I'm sorry, Alex Bethel. I think he's getting himself sued. I don't know that he's You think he's getting himself sued? Uh, Mr. McEachin, I think we may uh, be hearing you there if you might be able to mute your, your uh, audio there. Thank you, sir. Mr. DeSane, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the hard work is already done. In fact, the ADT is the nation's first coast-to-coast non-motorized recreation trail. On the East Coast, the trailhead is in the Delmarva Peninsula in Delaware, and the West Coast the trailhead is in Point Reyes National Seashore near San Francisco. 
In the central portion, the trail has northern and southern alternates, passing through Chicago to the north and St. Louis to the south. In total, including both the north and south routes, the trail runs almost 7,000 miles. The trail passes through 14 national parks and 16 national forests and uses sections of or connects to five national scenic trails, 10 national historic trails, and 23 national recreation trails. The National Discovery Trails Act is an important step in the right direction to recognize the importance of the ADT by officially incorporating into the U.S. trail system and to promote this national resource to the public. Unfortunately, we've been unable to get a response until yesterday from the Park Service. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and the Ranking Member for having this hearing because it's begun a, com a com conversation, I hope, that we'll hear more from, from the Park Service where we can uh, deal with the differences right now. I want to be respectful of the Park Service, but I'm very excited about working with your committee staff and the Park because I understand that they are going to commit to do that, the Park Service, to get to a point where we will be in agreement and can get the bill moved successfully. Before I close, I'd like to thank the Discovery Trail Society for their support of the trail and this legislation. They've put enormous work into this from coast to coast and almost all of our districts affected by this. Uh, you will hear from their president today about the important work that they do to keep the trail safe and accessible to millions of Americans. Again, I want to thank you both and the committee for your consideration and be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields, uh, gentleman yields back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Desaune, and certainly proud to support your legislation and do everything we can to get it across the finish line. Uh, the chair will now recognize uh, the gentlewoman from New Mexico, Chairwoman Ledger Fernandez. Thank you so much, Chair Naguz and Ranking Member Fulcher. Uh, before joining Congress, I had the honor to serve as the Vice Chair of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. To provide a bit more context, I'd note that my family and I have lived and breathed New Mexico for 17 generations. We are proud to be a part of its rich history and culture. I introduced H.R. 6589, the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act, so that we can preserve places of struggle and perseverance across America. I also want to emphasize that H.R. 6589 is needed as well so that we can rebuild our infrastructure efficiently and responsibly after the enactment of the bipartisan infrastructure law and also so that we can support local economic development and jobs, especially for rural communities. The Historic Pre and Preservation Enhancement Act provides permanent authorization to the Historic Preservation Fund, or HPF, and does double its deposit to 300 mil million per year. The bill would also make amounts in the HPF available for expenditure without further congressional appropriations. I'm amazed at all the good that the Historic Preservation Fund does. Let me share a bit of that with you. It provides matching grants to states, tribes, and local governments, and nonprofit organizations to pay for surveys, training, and grants. The Historic Preservation Fund also supports import, important competitive grant programs like the American Civil Rights Grants Program, the Paul Brune Historic Revitalization Grants Program. These investments have enabled things like two Main Street revitalization projects in Brigham City, Utah. The Idaho State Historic Preservation Office's work to complete a nomination for the Nez Perce Tribe's Rapid River Fishery. The two-story adobe hacienda at the Los Luceros Historic Site in my district. And so much more across all of our districts, across all of America. But despite chronic underfunding, and it has been underfunded for decades, for more than four decades, it's been underfunded. Despite this, the HPF has facilitated nearly 90,000 listings on the National Register, surveyed millions of acres to protect significant cultural resources, and listen to this, it has leveraged over $100 billion in private investment through the historic tax credit, $100 billion. That tax credit has rehabilitated 47,000 historic buildings and created nearly 3 million local jobs. This is a job um, bill as well. We need to remember that. 
But we need to recognize the value of the HPF and help it meet the growing needs of state and tribal historic preservation officers and communities across our country. While the additional funding and long-term certainty provided this bill, we will enable state and historic tribal historic preservation officers to better protect our culture, our herencia, and facilitate infrastructure and economic development. Through the National Historic Preservation Act, federal agencies must consider how their projects impact historic properties. This means SHPOs and TIPOs are a key part of advancing many projects. In fiscal year 2021, SHPO offices reviewed over 124,000 federal undertakings. That's 2,100 per office per year. This is an increase of close to 14,000 reviews from the previous fiscal year. TIPOs face the same growing demand. I proudly voted for the bipartisan infrastructure law because I know how important it is to invest in clean water for our communities, broadband for school children's education, telehealth and businesses, and roads so that our commerce can get to market and supply chains can get unclogged. Aren't we all in favor of that kind of good work on the ground that makes our community stronger? Well, while the infrastructure bill was an amazing achievement, who in this committee would be against getting that infrastructure actually built? Well, to get that broadband built, we need to comply with the Section 106 process, and that means our TIPOs and SHPOs need the funding to clear the projects. So while some of my colleagues may be concerned with some aspects of the bill, I would say that HPF is just too important. In fact, Congress has chosen to provide mandatory funding to other programs it considers critical, like it did for the Land and Conservation Fund on a bipartisan basis. We must fully fund our historic preservation officers as we undertake the historic investments in infrastructure and as we build a richer and more prosperous and equitable America. I welcome the opportunity to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and the administration to make any necessary adjustments to the bill, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. I yield back. General, General Lady yields back. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Roger Fernandez, for introducing this important legislation. Uh, I want to thank both of the sponsoring members of Congress for their valuable testimony. Uh, we will now transition to our second panel. Uh, as with the first panel, oral uh, statements are limited to five minutes, but your entire statement will be made part of the hearing record when you begin. Uh, the timer, uh, you may proceed to the dais there. Um, when you begin, the timer will start. It'll turn orange uh, when you have one minute remaining, then red when your time has expired. The chair now recognizes Ms. Joy Beasley, Associate Director of Cultural Resources, Partnerships, and Science at the National Park Service, uh, Ms. Beasley, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Nagoose, Ranking Member Fulcher, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of the Interior's views on the bills on today's agenda. I'd like to submit our full statements for the record and summarize the Department's views. H.R. 4878 would amend the National Trail System Act to establish a new category of trail that may be designated as part of the act and would designate the American Discovery Trail as the first national discovery trail. The bill further amends the National Trail System Act by establishing criteria for national discovery trails. The department appreciates the goals of the bill and believes that there may be other means of achieving its vision of enhanced recreational opportunities outside of protected lands. However, we believe that these goals would be better achieved without designating a new category of national discovery trails within the National Trail System. We'd welcome the opportunity to work with the subcommittee and the bill sponsor on an alternate means of achieving the goals of this bill. H.R. 6589 would permanently reauthorize and increase annual amounts to be deposited into the Historic Preservation Fund from $150 million to $300 million. It makes amounts deposited each year available for expenditure without further appropriation or fiscal year limitation. Additionally, the bill requires that shortfalls from the initial fund source of oil and gas leases be replenished with deposits from the general treasury. The bill also adds requirements for the president to submit detailed program allocations for expenditure and an annual reporting requirement. The department supports this legislation and would like to work with the sponsor and committee to submit amendments. The Historic Preservation Fund is the primary federal funding source directed towards carrying out the National Historic Preservation Act, 
the cornerstone of our nation's public policy on historic preservation. The Historic Preservation Fund's permanent reauthorization would continue the more than 50-year National Preservation Partnership Program at the federal, state, tribal, and local levels and continue preservation of our shared national history for all Americans, current and future. H.R. 6805 would direct the Secretary of the Interior to establish a program within the National Park Service to be known as the United States African American Burial Grounds Preservation Program. This program would be authorized to make grants and enter into cooperative agreements with appropriate entities to identify, preserve, restore, inter and interpret African American burial grounds. The department supports this bill. This program, as outlined in the bill, would need to be implemented in a respectful and collaborative manner to ensure these already fragile and sacred resources do not become damaged or vandalized if and when their locations are known. The department and the National Park Service would be honored to support and respectfully implement the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Program. H.R. 7002 would direct the Secretary of the Interior to authorize the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri to be illuminated by blue and yellow lights in support of Ukraine for a period of time to be designated by the Secretary. The administration stands with the people of Ukraine. Lighting the Gateway Arch in support and solidarity for the people of Ukraine is important to many Americans and to people around the world. If enacted, the department stands ready to implement this legislation. H.R. 7075 would designate the Ukraine Independence Park in Washington, D.C. at a location under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service containing the Taras Shevchenko Memorial. The department supports this legislation. Shevchenko, a 19th century Ukrainian poet and artist, spent many years imprisoned for his pro-Ukrainian independence activities in Tsarist Russia. He is revered for his literary works and self-sacrificing contributions to the people of Ukraine. H.R. 7218 would extend the authority of the Secretary of the Interior to provide financial assistance to three national heritage areas in Colorado through fiscal year 2036. The department supports this legislation. Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, Kaj Lapuder National Heritage Area, and South Park National Heritage Area each tell important stories of our nation's diverse history and through partnerships promote heritage conservation and economic development. Chairman Nagus, this concludes my statement. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Beasley, for your testimony. Uh, we'll now proceed with member questions. Members are reminded that they're limited to five minutes. Uh, for their questions. Uh, I will start, uh, I rarely do this, but by recognizing myself for five minutes, and I don't intend to take uh, the full balance of my time. Uh, Ms. Beasley, I want to say thank you for your testimony and, and for being here today, um, and for your support or your, your statements regarding several of the bills that we're considering. Uh, I do want to dig in a little bit on H.R. 4878, and uh, I would just simply say from my understanding, I, I was not in Congress uh, when the last hearing was held on this bill some seven or eight years ago, uh, but this is a proposal that has been made uh, for many years in the Congress, and the National Park Service has, of course, had an opportunity to weigh in at every juncture. I think it's an idea whose time has come, and while I certainly appreciate the National Park Service's feedback and technical insight about potential changes that could be made to the bill, and I suspect uh, my good friend and colleague from California would be open and receptive to some of those changes. Uh, I, I don't think um, that simply finding another vehicle and not proceeding with this legislation is, is a viable option, at least in my uh, humble view. Um, I support the bill and uh, am committed to doing what we can to, to help Mr. Desaunay get that bill into a form that it can ultimately secure passage on the floor. So I would just simply encourage the department um, that given that the, uh, at least the desire by many on this committee, myself included as the chair, to see this bill move forward, that, uh, that NPS would engage with the sponsor about technical fixes that could be made, understanding that there may be, and it appears there is, uh, a, a perhaps conceptual difference in terms of where NPS is and where uh, the elected members uh, uh, on the committee are. So if you'd like to respond, but it's not much of a question, I suppose, more of a statement. But Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And uh, 
we'd be pleased to have the opportunity to work with the, the, the sponsor and the subcommittee to uh, figure out a way to achieve the, the goals of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beasley. Uh, I, again, I think every bill, including uh, Chair Ledger Fernandez's bill, uh, is a bill, or are bills rather, that merit the support of every member of this committee. Uh, they are, uh, you know, bills that I think uh, will make a difference and should not prove to be too controversial, and certainly hope my colleagues uh, will agree. And with that, I will yield back the balance of my time and recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Beasley for being here today. Most of my dialogue is in regard to H.R. 6589, Historic Preservation Enhancement Act. But I'd like to just point out that since the Biden administration has taken office, there's not been one new single offshore oil and gas lease that's been approved. And the one lease sale that, that we did hold was later thrown out by the courts. And the administration didn't even defend it. So from your standpoint, do you know how much revenue that, that that one lease sale would have generated or was estimated to have generated should it have moved forward? Sir, uh, I'm only prepared to speak on the bills that are um, it actually- It is $191 million. So just keep that number in mind because how much does the Historic Preservation Fund currently receive annually from offshore oil and gas revenue? Is that, do you know the answer to that? Well, the appropriations to the fund have, uh, have fluctuated over the years. This was the, the first, uh, FY22 was the first uh, funding year where uh, those, the, the funds exceeded the uh, $150 million. It's approximately $150 million. And so what would have likely come from that project would have been about 127% more than what was necessary for the Historic Preservation Fund. Ms. Beasley, if the administration supports the Historic Preservation Fund, how do you explain refusing to go forward with a lease that would have generated that type of revenue to fund what we're trying to do? Sir, uh, the Department of the Interior supports the very good work that the Historic Preservation Fund enables, and we support uh, its uh, permanent authorization. It reduces the amount of resources necessary to fund what's on the docket today. And that's important to point out. As I mentioned in the opening statement, the average American is paying about $4.12 right now for a gallon of gas. Do you remember what it was approximately a year ago? I do not, sir. It was approximately $2.88, so it's up about 40%. Similarly, and I'll just jump forward on this with a, 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 a gallon of milk, currently about $3.92, and it has increased by about 18%. The point being is, is that people that we serve are feeling that. That's a, a, it's kind of that unseen but highly felt tax. So given the circumstances that we're in on that, does the Biden administration really believe that now is the appropriate time with all that inflation and the impact of that to add an additional $300 million to the debt every year in perpetuity? I appreciate your question, sir. Uh, again, I'm, I'm here to, to speak on behalf of the six bills that are before the committee. Um, I think questions regarding uh, the... And this uh, is in regard to 6589 because that's the incremental debt that what you're proposing would, would add to at a time when we simply can't afford to do that. 6589 contains a provision that if the $300 million derived from offshore oil and gas revenue is not available for deposit, that that money will come from taxpayer dollars. Were you aware that was not the original intent of the preservation fund to go to taxpayer dollars? It was supposed to be funded through oil and gas lease revenue. Sir, it's uh, up to the Congress to determine how appropriations are funded. I just wanted to point out and make sure you were aware that this has a provision in it, that if the funds are not there from the revenue off oil uh, leases, 
that it what does roll into the treasury and is drawn from taxpayer money that way. That was not the original intent. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Ms. Ledger Fernandez. Thank you so much, Chair Nagus, and thank you, uh, Ms. Beasley, for joining us here today to answer questions about um, the bills before you. Um, I really appreciated your testimony. I appreciate the support of the National Park Service for 6589, especially given all of the good work that it does. Um, and I wanted to um, talk a little bit more about um, that bill and how it is important to make sure that we expand and guarantee the support for the Hispanic for the Historic Preservation Fund because of the importance of the investments that we've talked about uh, and, um, and preserving our American history and culture. Because without that, once we bulldoze something down that should have been preserved, it's gone forever, correct, Ms. Beasley? Yes, ma'am. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, there is a tie-in, a very important tie-in to the work that we are doing to try to invest in our infrastructure, to build the kinds of things that we need to make sure that our communities have clean water, to make sure that our children have the broadband they need for education, to make sure that we address the issues around the ports and the roads. Um, and But all of those would trigger Section 106, and isn't it correct that the Historic Preservation Fund helps the state preservation, the SHPOs and the TIPOs meet their obligations under Section 106. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. So if we don't actually provide the Historic Preservation Fund with the resources it needs, that could, in the end, starve the SHPOs and the TIPOs and all those who are doing that important work to help us get this infrastructure done. That, is, that, is that a logical connection there, Ms. Beasley? That's correct. Uh, the funding from the Histor Historic Preservation Fund allows states and tribes and local governments to fulfill their responsibilities under the National Historic Preservation Act by providing staffing for funding and technical assistance that allows them to efficiently and effectively complete their Section 106 reviews. Right. And you also pointed out how um, the, the, the amount hasn't changed since 1980, correct? That is correct, ma'am. So, so while, while the work that is funded by the Historic Preservation Fund has grown incredibly, the amount hasn't funded. And can you repeat again, did it ever get fund, actually funded so that the money went out to the TIPOs and the SHPOs above $150 million ever before? Uh, FY22 was the first year in which uh, the appropriations exceeded the $150 million. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, and what's interesting is there happens, according to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, there has actually been $6.3 billion uh, deposited into the fund since 1980, uh, but only $2.5 has actually come out and gone to SHPOs, uh, and only recently at an amount like $170 million, which was still short. Um, so there is actually money that's in there that is not coming out and, and being used. Uh, so it's sitting in there right now. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so I understand that you want to make some technical corrections to the current bill so that MPS has the flexibility it needs. Um, so I, I understand that we look forward to working with you on the technical corrections you identified. Um, but, but could you describe how mandatory full funding from the Historic Preservation Fund would help NPS better plan and administer the formula, based, uh, the for both the formula-based and the competitive grant funding made available by the fund? Can you repeat your question? I just want to make sure I yeah. understand the The question. first one was, we'll work with you on the technical language. The, se the question was, how would mandatory uh, full funding uh, help NPS better plan and administer the, the, both the formula funding and the competitive grant funding, if you actually knew that this money was going to be available to, to you? Sure. Well, you know, these, these funds... Uh, cover activities, a whole range of activities from inventory 
and uh, nominating properties of the National Register, physical preservation projects, planning, um, and you know, part of what's what the National Historic Preservation Act did was was codify that historic preservation is a, is an appropriate uh, pursuit of the federal government. So, um, you know, I think if nothing else, it would it would it would demonstrate um, that that full and permanent commitment to preserving our, our nation's uh, heritage resources in perpetuity. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, my time has expired, but without objection, I'd like to enter into the record letters and expressions of support for this bill. Um, the bill supporters include a broad staff of organizations, including the National Trust for Historic Preservation, National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, serves so National Conference, Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, the American Cultural Resources Association, National Parks Conservation, American Battlefield Trust, Society for American Archaeology, other advisory council on historic preservation. We would like to to uh, submit those letters, uh, and, and we have more than I listed, but I don't want to take up any more time. <laughs> Without objection, so ordered. Uh, before I recognize uh, Mr. Tiffany, I'd ask unanimous consent as well to enter into the record an article uh, from USA Today dated March 1st of 2019. Uh, headline is Trump administration set to roll out massive offshore oil plan, but many in GOP don't want it, uh, quotes the South Carolina Governor, uh, Republican governor, uh, saying that he opposes the drilling, and uh, the governor of Georgia saying, I just don't think we need to be doing it off the coast of Georgia, and so on and so forth, uh, without objection. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in that same vein, uh, there's something I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent that goes sure. into Before, the record. So without objection, the article will be entered okay. into the record. Proceed. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, this morning, Politico reported that the Interior Department uh, does not have immediate plans to hold any new offshore oil and gas uh, uh, lease sales or release a new five-year plan for future uh, lease sales. And uh, apparently there's some quotes directly that supports that from uh, Secretary Holland. So if, uh, if acceptable, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask you now consent that article be included in the record for today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. The chair recognizes Mr. Tiffany for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Beasley, thanks so much for being here today. Um, I, I want to touch on another issue real quickly before we get into the subject at hand here, 6589. Uh, the Park Service has shared its plan to control the deer population. Sounds like it's a real problem here in D.C. in the parks. And, um, uh, and the idea has been floated of bringing predators here, possibly even wolves. Uh, is that accurate? Sir, I'm not prepared to speak on that, uh, but we'd be pleased to follow up with you after the hearing. And, and that would be terrific because Wisconsin would be happy to donate the number of wolves that Washington, D.C. would like to have to control their deer population. And I can assure you that those wolves will control your deer population. We have firsthand experience with that. And plus, having a few, and by the way, shipping is free, no returns, and um, um, the uh, a few more predators in Washington D.C. I'm sure no one will notice. Um, can, in regards to the Historic Preservation Fund, um, it seems like its funding source is being cut off. Um, how can you? Why is Park Service supporting this if the funding source is being taken away? Well, sir, as I've said, we, we support the important work that the Historic Preservation Fund enables, and, and we support its permanent reauthorization. Um, it's up to the Congress to determine the source of the funding. Have you done an actuarial study to see when the money will run out? As the ranking member just cited here, um, there's going to be no more new leases to be able to fund this. Have you done an actuarial study within the department when the money's going to run out? Uh, sir, I, I'm, not a, I, I'm not prepared to respond to that question, but we can follow up with you on the record. That would be terrific. I would really appreciate it. Um, so the uh, damage to America continues. I mean, we just saw the um, uh, economic numbers today that have come out. Um, if we have another quarter like this one, we'll officially be in a recession. Most people understand that uh, we are in a recession at this point. And uh, a lot of that has to do with not utilizing our natural resources. 
Um, it is so important for us to be able to utilize, uh, to make sure we have a strong economy uh, in order to have a good environment. Because what we're going to see with this program here is it's going to run out of money. And why is it going to run out of money? Because we're not utilizing our own natural resources rather than getting it from another country. I mean, think about it. Um, President Biden has begged Iran, Venezuela, um, the OPEC countries to drill for oil, but he doesn't beg us. He doesn't enable the producers here in America to do it. In fact, he actively works to shut it down. And um, another interesting fact is, did you know that we imported more Russian oil last year than we did in the years previous? When uh, the Biden administration says that um, they want to make sure that we're cutting off Russia, we're actually importing more oil from them last year. Um, it really doesn't make any sense. The other thing that this does is it drives us deeper into debt. Um, $30 trillion and counting. Um, and here we have another mandatory spending bill that comes before us. We've seen a number of them in natural resources, right? Over the course of uh, this session where we have this mandatory spending on what I would say are wants. And they're really nice wants. Um, but are they needs for the American people? Are they needs as in food, clothing, affordable energy? I mean, I think about right now, we pay over $2 a gallon for propane in our district. I'm among the 30% of the people in the 7th Congressional District of Wisconsin that burn propane. We paid 80 cents a gallon back in August of 2020. And it's costing far more to heat our homes. So while this is a, a wonderful want, does it meet the needs of the American people? And that's where I think this falls short. So unfortunately, um, I can't support something like this that is a wonderful want, but it does not meet the needs of the American people, especially as we're heading into a Biden recession that has come about as a result of excessive spending and shutting down the natural resources utilization that we have in such abundance here in America. It's terribly unfortunate. It's an unforced error. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Rosendale for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Beasley, uh, what's the primary source right now of the funding for the Historic Preservation Fund? Sir, it's funded from uh, offshore oil and gas leasing. Okay. And so the declining revenues that, that we have all been talking about and experiencing um, for the oil and gas leases could very well have a negative impact on the Historic Preservation Fund. Could they not? Can you repeat your question, sir? The declining revenues that we see because of the decrease in leasing, okay, the, the stoppage of leasing for that matter, won't they cause a decline in the revenues that would be available to the Historic Preservation Fund? Well, again, sir, we support the work that the Historic Preservation Fund accomplishes. It's up to Congress to determine the, the revenue source. So based upon the, the scenario and the, the, uh, the, the formulas that are in place now, okay, would that not cause a decrease in funding that is available for the Historic Preservation Fund? Again, it's, it's up to Congress to determine funding levels, sir, and where the fund comes from. As it exists now. Right now, would that not cause a decrease in the funding? You really don't like to answer yes or no questions very well. Would it not cause a decrease in the funding that is available for the historic fund, historic preservation fund? We support the important work that the historic preservation fund accomplishes. I understand that. We heard that several times now. It's up to Congress to determine where those funds come from, sir. Okay, so... Let's talk about those funds. Uh, we all know that the leases are being, they've been stopped, okay? We're not, we haven't started any new leasing. And, and what's even more problematic, quite frankly, is that it's a two-step process. You let out leases, but if you don't issue permits, 
then the production doesn't begin anyway. So you're really only generating a very small portion of the revenue that would be available. It's the production, it's the royalties, it's, that is where the, the bulk of the money is going to be obtained from. So this body was able to pass, in a, in a huge bipartisan fashion, the uh, LWCF, the Land Water Conservation Act, okay? And, and that was to make sure that we had proper funding to take care of the enormous backlog that we have in our national parks, the maintenance that was, that was direly needed. So if we are to take this legislation, H.R. 6589, and pass that, all of a sudden we are going to prioritize these historic preservation funds over the maintenance backlog that has been created over many years for our national park system at the very time that we are experiencing 30 to 50% increases in travel into those parks. And you're going to be directing funds away from that because they would be competing. Do you think that that is acceptable? Sir, I, I'm here to speak on behalf of the six bills that are before the committee today. I'm not an economist. Um, it's up to Congress to determine how best to balance um, the many needs uh, that, that federal agencies have. Correct. But you have input. You are here to give input. And, and again, would you, do you not understand that you're going to have these competing interests? And do you think that after, in a bipartisan fashion, that we were able to finally bring Congress together and pass an investment into our national parks, that it is wise to now start taking that money away from those very institutions that have this backlog of maintenance? Well, sir, as I've said, the Historic Preservation Fund provides funding to states and tribes and local communities to help ensure that they can conduct efficient reviews that are required under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and help move those federal projects forward. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Obernolte for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Beasley, for your testimony here today. I'd like to uh, ask a couple of questions regarding H.R. 4878. Uh, I know the chair had expressed uh, an interest in seeing this legislation move forward that the American Discovery Trail also cuts across my home state of California. Uh, it's a wonderful trail system. I think we all share a common interest in making sure that as many people as possible can, uh, can experience the beauty of that trail. Uh, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more on uh, your objection to uh, the bill. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I heard in your opening statement uh, your concerns about creating a new class of trails, the National Discovery Trails. Uh, have you considered perhaps designating the American Discovery Trail as a national recreational trail instead of creating a whole new class? Is that something that would be feasible? Sir, as I said in my, in my testimony, we, we do have some concerns about this bill. We'd be pleased to work with the sponsor and the, and the committee to, to try to find a way to meet the, the important goals of the bill without amending the National Trails Act. Okay. Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Yeah, I would be interested, Ms. Beasley, I guess, in the specific question that he posed about whether or not the NPS would consider this trail being a viable national recreational trail? Well, I think, I think we can follow up with you on the record after the hearing on that specific question. Okay, well, it's a gentleman's time. I'll yield back, but I, I guess I would just say on behalf of Mr. Salonier, who I don't know is posing questions today, I think we, we would hope for a prompt uh, response from NPS because I think that that's certainly germane to today's hearing. I'll sure. yield back to the gentleman. And Ms. Beasley, I think what you're hearing is, is bipartisan agreement that this is something that we would like to see accomplished and we'd like to work with the NPS in figuring out a way uh, to accomplish this uh, that's a win-win for everybody. So um, if you can, if I could ask a little bit more about uh, the new responsibilities that would be put on the National Park Service by designating this as part of the national trail system and how you see uh, the management role of uh, the American Discovery 
trail as uh, shifting between the National Park System and perhaps the American Discovery Trail Society, which, uh, as we know, has done good work on the trail so far. So is there a, a, a how do you see those responsibilities being, uh, being born? Sure, so National Trails, Scenic Trails, National Historic Trails really require uh, strong, viable, nonprofit support and, and multi-jurisdictional support. Uh, these are complex networks with many different jurisdictions, many different stakeholders involved. Uh, and so the Park Service is one of, is, is an, is one of the three administering agencies. Uh, so we sort of provide the, the coordination and, and oversight, but really the day-to-day the -day management uh, takes place at the local level, at the, the state level. So those day-to-day -day operations around signage, route management, visitor safety, et cetera, require really the voluntary support of, of landowners, partners, um, and other stakeholders. Okay, so, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of people that have a great love for the uh, this trail and would like to see uh, the national park system take a role in uh, helping to manage it and preserve it. Uh, we have a lot of great stakeholders involved. I'm hopeful, as the chair expressed, that there's a win-win here, uh, that we can incorporate this trail into the national trail system uh, and get some, steer some resources towards managing and preserving it uh, and do it in a way that everyone agrees. So uh, I would join the chair in, in urging the NPS to work with Congress to make that happen. Uh, and then in my remaining, remaining time, if, if I could ask a question, in your testimony on H.R. 6805, you had mentioned that many African-American burial grounds are deliberately unmarked uh, and that the program would need to uh, be implemented in, a way, implemented in a way that ensures that uh, they aren't damaged or vandalized if and when their locations are publicly known. Can you talk a little bit more about that, in particular, how that would interact with other laws that are already on the books, such as the Archaeological Resources Protection Act? Sure, thank you, and that's a, re that's a really important question. Um, one of the most important things about this bill is that it provides resources directly to the organizations and individuals and communities that are already doing this important work. Um, cemeteries, to your point, are considered archeological resources, um, but ARPA applies to archeological resources on, on uh, federal and tribal lands. Um, so, the program would have to comply with all applicable federal laws, including ARPA, if that were um, applicable in, in that specific instance. All right, thank you. I see I'm out of time, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Thank the gentleman for very uh, insightful questions. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Moore for five minutes. Thank you, chair. Because my good friend uh, from Missouri, Congresswoman Wagner was unable to attend today's hearing. I would like to share the remarks she would have given regarding her bill, H.R. 7002, the Gateway Solidarity Act. As we hold this hearing today, Russian forces continue their unconscionable assault on Ukraine, targeting countless civilians and forcing millions of innocent people to flee their homes. In response to this unprovoked and abhorrent invasion, cities throughout the United States and the world have illuminated historic landmarks with the colors of the, of the Ukrainian flag. From the Eiffel Tower to the Empire State Building, the illumination of these internationally beloved landmarks sends the message that communities around the globe stand, stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. The Gateway Arch is a symbol of pride for the people of St. Louis and the state of Missouri. As the defining structure of the St. Louis skyline, the arch can be seen for miles throughout the region. HR 7002, the Gateway Solidarity Act, would direct the Department of the Interior to illuminate the Gateway Arch in St. Louis with the colors of the Ukrainian flag. This legislation has the unanimous support of the entire Missouri delegation as well as the National Park Service and our Senate colleagues have indicated that this bill can be immediately passed once it is sent across into their chamber. This bill should be ex expeditiously moved through this committee, the House, the Senate, and sent to the President's desk. desk. Thank you and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, give a moment if anybody else is on Zoom who would like to participate and ask a question. If not, uh, Representative DeSarnay, I just want to make sure 
if you'd like to ask any questions, you certainly uh, you certainly can. I just want to make sure I give you that opportunity. Uh, you are on mute, I believe. No, I, I'd just like to thank you all for the for the uh, positive support and look forward to working with the Park Service uh, for, as was said, a win-win. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeSalonne. Uh, thank you, Ms. Beasley, for your testimony, for appearing today before the committee. Um, and uh, we uh, certainly appreciate you uh, coming today. And we will proceed uh, with the next panel. I believe votes have been called, or are they, they're, about or they're about to be called. Um, so uh, I think we're going to try to proceed as far as we can, and then, and then we'll go to votes. Um, but we'll go ahead and proceed to the third panel. Thank you, Ms. Beasley. As with the first two panels, oral statements are limited to five minutes. Uh, the witnesses may proceed to the dais there. But your entire statement will be made part of the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will start. It'll turn orange when you have one minute remaining and red when your time has expired. The chair will first recognize Mr. Eric Seaborg. We'll let you all get in your seats first. Um, President of the American Discovery Trail Society. I'm, I'm virtual. Oh, you're virtual. All right. Well, Mr. Seaborg, uh, you then yeah. may proceed. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for being here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I just want to I want to thank the subcommittee for the invitation to address this hearing and thank the many members who have co-sponsored HR 4878, the National Discovery Trails Act. This bipartisan legislation has 62 co-sponsors from 24 states, broad support for the belief that National Discovery Trails will benefit the entire nation. Um, the National Discovery Trail ID, ID I can't, uh, I've got to point out was a National, Dis National Park Service idea in the first place. So I'm here to ask you for your support for the bill on behalf of the American Discovery Trail Society, countless hikers, bicyclists, and equestrians, and many other groups across the country that might surprise you. Groups like small city visitor centers and county economic development commissions. Now, the reason the American Discovery Trail belongs in the national trail system is because it is the nation's only coast-to-coast -coast, non-motorized trail, and the system contains no such trail. By, by its design, the American Discovery Trail adds the missing connections our national trails need to become a true system. Now, the new category of trails, of national trail, is needed to meet the primary purpose in the National Trails System Act in the Statement of Policy, where it says that to provide for the increasing outdoor recreation needs of an expanding population, trails should be established primarily, primarily near urban areas, and secondarily within scenic areas and along historic travel routes, which are often more, relo more remotely located. The two categories of national long distance trails, scenic and historic, meet this secondary purpose admirably, but by their very definition, they cannot meet the primary purpose of bringing national trails to urban areas. The American Discovery Trail is designed to fill this unmet need. In its 6,800 miles from sea to shining sea, the ADT traverses 15 states and the District of Columbia. It connects urban areas, towns, and small cities with remote and scenic mountains, high plains, deserts, and red rock canyons. It links the National Scenic Trails, National Historic Trails, and National Recreation Trails and provides the backbone of a true system that allows the traveler to walk from almost any region of the country to another. The route was developed by citizens working with federal, state, and local land managers. It is entirely on publicly accessible land and requires no land acquisition. It incorporates existing hiking trails, towpaths, rail trails, country roads, small town sidewalks, and big city greens. The management of each segment in the hands of, local, of a local organization or government already caring for it. And thus, the ADT does not add to the management or maintenance tasks of federal agencies. Travelers have been using the trail continuously for the past 25 years using our society's complete turn-by-turn -turn directions and electronic GPS guides. Congress recognized the importance of the ADT in the John Dingell Act in 2019 with a provision directing federal land managers to allow signage marking it. This provision has led to successful partnerships between the 
ADT Society with local units of the National Park Service, Forest Service, and Bureau of Land Management in marking the route. With the ADT Society paying for the signs, which brings up an important point. We are not asking for increased federal expenditures or any expen expansion of federal control. We are simply asking for the recognition of this unique resource as a part of the national trail system. As I mentioned previously, the National Discovery Trail concept originated, originated with the National Park Service. The idea came when the National Park Service study examined the feasibility of adding the American Discovery Trail to the national trail system. The NPS team saw that a new approach was needed to bring national trails to more people. Bringing such a trail to where people live not only encourages them to get out in nature and engage in healthful exercise, it allows them to participate in a dream. It offers millions of people an opportunity to step onto a trail near their home and dream of going coast to coast and see all there is to see in America. So we are asking you to help us create this dream. The Appalachian Trail was proposed more than a century ago and took generations to become the most famous footpath in the world. The American Discovery Trail has similar potential that we are asking you to help bring to fruition. Future generations will thank the leaders of today who had the foresight to make the American Discovery Trail an official part of the national trail system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Nick Loris, Vice President of Public Policy at C3 Solutions. Thank you, Chair Nagus, Ranking Member Fulcher, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Nick Loris, and I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Conservative Coalition for Climate Solutions. C3 Solutions is a think tank that focuses on policy reforms to empower entrepreneurs and innovators to solve our greatest energy and environmental challenges. Given the range of legislative proposals covered in this hearing, I will cover a few topics. First, the importance of the Historic Preservation Fund. Second, the link between energy production on federal lands and waters and conservation. Third, the potential economic and environmental drawbacks of restricting offshore resource development. Fourth and finally, how increasing and diversifying energy supplies can enhance energy security, help our European allies, and advance climate ambitions. First, the Historic Preservation Fund is an important resource that helps to preserve and to share America's history and culture with present and future generations. Allocating money to rural communities, HBCUs, tribes, nationally significant preservation projects, and much more provides valuable resources to communities and helps to educate the public more broadly. With respect to the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act, I do have concerns that making HPF a mandatory program delegates the power of the purse away from Congress, I also have concerns that empowering a president from either party to distribute HPF funds may result in those funds going toward projects where the political benefits outweigh the preservation ones. Secondly, revenues for historic preservation fund are derived from offshore oil and gas development. In addition to the jobs, economic gains, and energy security benefits from energy production on federal lands and waters, the government revenues collected are a significant contributor to conservation efforts. Beyond the HPF, government receipts fund coastal restoration, outdoor recreation, and tackling the deferred maintenance backlog at America's national parks. Third, limiting domestic energy production could impose significant economic harm for minimal environmental benefits. Regrettably, in his first week in office, President Biden enacted a review of the federal oil and gas leasing program that became a de facto moratorium. For the first time in more than 40 years, the Interior Department will soon be without a five-year program for offshore oil and natural gas leasing. Restricted access to offshore energy development would not only deliver an economic blow to Gulf Coast communities, but it would also reduce funding for programs like the HPF. According to a recent National Offshore Industries Association report, a delay in the five-year program could reduce government, re government revenues by $1.5 billion per year on average and $27.8 billion through 2040. Furthermore, if production shifts to private lands and to countries where the environmental standards are less rigorous, or higher natural gas prices extend the use of coal generation, the purported emissions reductions may be less than advertised or perhaps even higher. Fourth, the reality is that Russia's invasion of Ukraine and high gas prices have brought energy affordability and energy security to the forefront of the political conversation. And I commend the members for voicing their overwhelming bipartisan support to the Ukrainian people and for conveying their support for the freedom and rule of law. The Ukrainian Independence Park Act is an important expression of that support. 
The Biden administration's deal to provide Europe with more liquefied natural gas exports is also an important commitment of that support, but actions speak louder than words. Policy reforms need to liberalize domestic energy markets for the benefit of American families and to help our European allies by providing them with more energy choices. Diversification will be the key to weaning Europe off Russian natural gas dependence and ultimately to stop Russia from manipulating energy markets for geopolitical purposes. Those energy choices will likely be a combination of exported natural gas, new nuclear and more renewable power, among other energy sources and technologies. In the United States, that requires access to our abundance of natural resources and building more energy infrastructure. Policymakers should remove barriers to energy innovation and modernize regulations that curtail investment and needlessly lengthen permitting and construction timelines. Driving down costs and speeding up deployment will result in more jobs, more affordable energy, and higher levels of prosperity. The environmental outcome will be fewer emissions and more federal revenues for conservation and for historic preservation and it will mean more choice for our European allies. Getting new energy supplies to the market isn't going to happen overnight, but it can and should happen a lot faster. Given Russia's recent decision to cut off natural gas supplies to Poland and Bulgaria, time is of the essence. In conclusion, I appreciate the subcommittee's dedication to the preservation of America's landmarks, historic sites, and areas of cultural significance. And I commend the subcommittee for their unwavering support of the for the people of Ukraine. Capitalizing on America's resource abundance and human ingenuity is a way to help with both. It is an opportunity to advance econo America's economic, energy security, and environmental goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Reno K. Oni Franklin, chairman of the Ku Shia Pomo tribe. Uh, pretty close, pretty close. I hope so. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you. And, and I, I cheated. I looked up how to say your name properly. So I cheated. Uh, <laughs> Chairman Nagu. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And, uh, and, and Ranking Member Fulcher as well, and the rest of the members of the committee. And my wife, my Emta, Reno County Franklin. I'm chairman of the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians. And uh, I'm speaking to you today with multiple hats on, but really uh, between them, as a tribal chairman and also representing the uh, uh, National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers. Um, so I, I'd first like to thank uh, Congresswoman uh, Ledger Fernandez for sponsoring this bill. Uh, TIPOs and our partners, uh, our, 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 our brothers and sisters at the state, the state historic preservation officers, are the backbone of our nation's efforts to preserve and protect the places and resources that tell the story of our country. Um, TIPOs are uh, tribal historic uh, preservation officers, and these are tribally appointed officials uh, whose responsibility is uh, to uh, consult with uh, federal agencies and other stakeholders uh, and protect and preserve um, tribal sacred sites, uh, historic sites, and cultural sites. Um, the, uh, the TIPOs were authorized under the uh, National Historic Preservation Act. And sadly, um, the funding that we get um, is nowhere near the amount that's needed to adequately accomplish the task that we have before us. Um, by permanently authorizing the, the Historic Preservation Fund at $300 million and fully funding it, that's the real key there, the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act would provide TIPOs and SHIPOs with the resources that we sorely need to consult on projects in a timely and efficient manner, and the permanent auth reauthorization and full funding at the higher level is essential for tribal nations uh, to continue to tell our own histories, um, to, to revitalize our cultures and our languages, and to protect our important resources and places. Uh, the HPF is an important tool for the preservation of each tribal nation's history. It allows us to tell the story of our culture, sacred sites, and our places of importance. The HPF plays an important role in allowing us to interpret the meaning of those places for those others who are around us. It helps us to tell our story the way that it was meant to be told. Um, in 2021, one TIPO office with three employees received 3,400 consultation requests. Not to say that TIPO offices on, on average, we only get $75,000 in funding. So you can imagine what it's like to get that many, 3,400 consultation requests in one year. That translates into 13,000 consultation requests, uh, excuse me, 13, not thousand, 13 consultation requests every workday, all year for these three TIPO staff. 
So 13 every workday all year. Uh, they're only able to respond to about 50% of these requests for consideration and consultation. This situation will only get worse as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is implemented in the coming years. These delays associated with underfunding not only threaten tribal nations, cultural resources, and sacred sites, they also hinder the American economy by creating unnecessarily, unnecessary delays uh, in infrastructure, clean energy projects that are important, not just for the, the country, but for, for tribal nations as well. Uh, tribes, we, uh, we see the solution as, as, as being something that, uh, this, that's provided here in this act. Um, <clears throat> There are 208 TIPOs, 564 uh, federally recognized tribes. So the number of TIPOs could increase. Uh, it makes it even more important uh, to, for the, uh, to increase the authorization of the HPF to 300 million and also to fully fund the HPF. So we need it fully funded to make sure that we can do our jobs. While I, I, while I am unequivocally supportive of this bill in its current form, I believe it would benefit from provisions guaranteeing that TIPOs uh, are specifically taken into account. This would include requiring a tribal set aside of a portion of the funding to be dedicated to TIPOs and guaranteeing that growth in the number of TIPOs is taken into consideration. So our goal is for the HPF funding to reflect the America of 2022, not the historic preservation funding priorities of America in 1976. Today's America recognizes that tribal nations and cultural resources are worthy of preserving and protecting. The tribal nations' sacred places are deserving of reverence and respect. Um, it, it is time for America to uh, show its respect for tribal nations to be respected through, through the uh, funding of its tipos and the protection of its sacred sites. And this is the best opportunity to do that. Uh, and thank you so much. I, uh, I would yield back. But if you don't mind, I would just like to also state that uh, American Indian tribes um, stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. And uh, and we are praying for them, just like all of you members of Congress are. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your testimony. Uh, as members are aware, we have votes on the House floor. We will take a recess. We're going to aim to reconvene around 430, uh, hopefully sooner than that. Uh, but staff will inform member offices once we have a better sense of exact timing. The committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair.
committee shall reconvene. Uh, we thank the witnesses and the members uh, for their courtesy as we uh, were on the floor for votes. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Angela Thorpe, director of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission at the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. Ms. Thorpe, you are recognized for five minutes. Greetings to the chair and members of the committee. I serve as the director of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. And in my work, I help constituents navigate an array of heritage-related matters, including issues on African American burial grounds like the one that you see here, Biddleville Cemetery. This historic cemetery served as a private burial ground in early surveys revealed a small number of burial sites and markers on the property, just over a dozen. As is the case for many historic African American burial grounds, what meets the eye is rarely revelatory of the truth. A comprehensive survey of the cemetery revealed this. Hundreds of unmarked graves that lay beneath the surface of this plot of land. Historically, African American burial practices have been severely restricted. Everything from plantation politics to legal restrictions have played a role in shaping how, when, and where African Americans were laid to rest. Additionally, untold numbers of African Americans have migrated across the country. Their family homes and family lands have changed hands over time. African American community landscapes have also changed drastically over time. Thus, these cemeteries are often left under-resourced, under-documented, and without consistent care on remote properties or within marginalized communities. As cities continue to evolve at a rapid rate in this country, a comprehensive, streamlined and clear strategy for documenting and preserving African American burial grounds is critical. These spaces will continue to be disturbed by construction projects, infrastructure improvements, and land development if they remain undocumented. The program proposed by the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act presents a pathway, a pathway away from the challenges I have described and towards expansive, meaningful, and reparative work. And the actions that the act calls for are feasible, and I see them often in my work across North Carolina. Consider Unity Cemetery in Edgecombe County. Here, municipal officials have approved $1.5 million to preserve the cemetery in phases over a period of five years in collaboration with descendants. In Southport, years of descendant-led maintenance, preservation, and documentation have led to new protections and engagement opportunities at John N. Smith Cemetery. The cemetery is a recent listing on the National Register for Historic Places, and an outdoor museum opened last fall, inviting visitors to this well-traveled coastal community to learn more about the cemetery's ties to Gullah Geechee culture. This interpretation practice is something that has yielded great success elsewhere, like Gear Cemetery in Durham. Elizabeth City State University students are transforming classroom learning into community practice after researching and documenting Oak Grove Cemetery, the resting place of the university's founder. Thus, when I consider the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act, I am excited by the opportunity to transform possibilities like those I have just offered you into best practice across our nation. The act will respond to the needs of descendants, advocates, and those that work in solidarity with them. Also, while several states, including North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Virginia, and Georgia, have limited strategies in place to respond to the needs of those descendants and advocacy groups, a streamlined strategy with a national focus would offer provision on a greater and more thorough scale. It is for these reasons, among others, that the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources joins hands with grassroots groups, descendants, 
nonprofits, and other governmental agencies in support of the African American Burial Grounds Preservation Act. I urge you to do the same, and I thank you for having me. Thank you in advance for your commitment towards preserving these sacred spaces. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Michael Saku, Vice President of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America and Director of the Ukrainian National Information Service. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee and national parks, forests, and public lands of the National Resources Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to address the subcommittee on two bills of particular significance to us as a Ukrainian American community, HR 7002 and HR 7075. I have submitted my written testimony and request that it be made part of the record. But might I further note for the record, my written testimony purposely, purposefully does not capitalize any reference to the country, dictator, or government of the aggressor state against Ukraine. Given the current genocide being perpetrated by that barbaric regime upon the Ukrainian nation, I hope you understand my organization's principled position in this matter. The organization that I represent is the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, the national umbrella organization representing the interests of two million Americans of Ukrainian descent. Founded in 1940 in Washington, D.C., the main purpose of the UCCA is to coordinate cultural, educational, and humanitarian activities the latter of which has increased dramatically in the past nine weeks since Russia's unprovoked war, but also since the earlier invasion of Eastern Ukraine and the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. Worldwide attention given to Ukraine since February 24, 2022 as a result of Russia's unprovoked war is of great importance to the Ukrainian American community. HR 7702 and 775 provide a unique opportunity to highlight symbolically the brave and heroic resolve of the Ukrainian people to maintain their independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. For decades, since Ukraine declared its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, the Ukrainian American community has been advocating for a greater bilateral relationship between Ukraine and the United States. It is in that framework that the Ukrainian American community supports HR 775 which would designate the National Park Service site in Northwest Washington, where a statue to Taras Shevchenko, the 19th century bard of Ukraine, currently resides, as Ukrainian Independence Park. My community and my organization, spearheaded by its longtime leader, Dr. Lev Dobryansky, sponsored the construction of the memorial in 1964. At its unveiling, former President Dwight Eisenhower astutely stated the statue to Shevchenko honors, quote, the memory of a poet who expressed so eloquently man's undenying determination to fight for freedom and his unquenchable faith in ultimate victory. The bronze statue's inscription carved on the pedestal states the following, quote, dedicated to the liberation, freedom, and independence of all captive nations. How foretelling that nearly 60 years later that phrase is as relevant today as it was then. Similarly, HR 7002 seeks authority to illuminate the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri, and Ukraine's national colors of blue and yellow, signifying the unmeasurable empathy of the, Ukraine, of the American nation for the people of Ukraine as they defend their sovereignty. To that point, I would like to add that not just the Gateway Arch, um, but also the White House and other historical landmarks should be illuminated in the blue and yellow national colors of Ukraine. As evident in today's announcement by the White House of a request for an additional $33 billion of supplemental assistance um, to Ukraine, the administration and the whole of the US government should undertake all means possible to support the people of Ukraine. I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank the United States Congress for all its efforts and overwhelming bipartisan initiatives to assist Ukraine and its people, not just in the past nine weeks of the war, but during the past eight years of the war and the decades of US strategic partnership. As the National Parks, Forest, and Public Lands Subcommittee review and mark up HR 7002 and HR 7075, the symbolism is a welcome gesture and show of support for Ukraine. While the Ukrainian community supports these measures, 
My written testimony clearly enumerates concrete actions in support of Ukraine both during and after wartime. Most notably, these actions include the designation of Russia as a state sponsor of terror. It is clear that Ukraine is at a critical juncture in its war to sustain its independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. Ukraine is not only defending itself, but the entire European continent and the, uh, the adherence of democratic principles. It is thus essential that the United States remain actively involved and continue to supply security and economic assistance to Ukraine. I thank the subcommittee and its members for your attention and consideration of my testimony, and I look forward to any remarks or questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The chair now recognizes Ms. Sabrina Stoker, executive director of the Pooter Heritage Alliance and a constituent of mine in Colorado's second congressional district. Welcome, Sabrina, and you are recognized for five minutes. Subcommittee Chair Nagoose, Ranking Member Fulcher, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Sabrina Stoker, and I'm the executive director of the Pooter Heritage Alliance, the managing entity for the Cache La Poudre River National Heritage Area. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the bipartisan Colorado National Heritage Areas Reauthorization Act, H.R. 7218, led by Chairman Nagoose, with primary co-sponsorship from Congressman Lamborn. Colorado has the honor of having three designated national heritage areas, Cache La Poudre, Sangre de Cristo, and South Park. Each of these landscapes are historically and culturally significant and have strong grassroots regional support. The Cache La Poudre National Heritage Area celebrates the vital role the region has played in the development of Western water law and the evolution of complex agricultural irrigation systems. We embrace the importance of culture to the people and places along the Cache La Poudre River and the inclusive nature of telling the stories of all people. The Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area is a crossroads of the centuries with 11,000 years of documented human habitation. Here, a unique blend of Native American, Hispango, Hispano, and Anglo settlements is reflected in the diversity of the people, art, and traditions. The geographic isolation of the high desert valley and the people's enduring ties to the land have given rise to a rich cultural heritage and ensured its preservation. South Park National Heritage Area preserves the authentic experiences of American prospectors, trappers, and even prehistoric man through the preservation of sites that include historic mines, ranches, railroads, and archaeological sites. South Park welcomes visitors to explore natural wonders and outdoor experiences in the still wild west. The Colorado National Heritage Areas do not own nor manage land within their respective areas. Rather, we strive to promote a variety of historical and cultural opportunities, engage visitors in the landscape, and inspire learning, preservation, recreation, and stewardship. At the Cache La Poudre National Heritage Area, our programs include opportunities for student learning, river safety initiatives, storytelling, visitor wayfinding, historic preservation, oral history documentation, and a variety of family-friendly events and activities along the river and its trail systems. Community grants promote partnerships throughout our region and are awarded for preservation, interpretation, development activities that celebrate the heritage area. In the past decade, we have invested over half a million dollars in 55 different community grants and leveraged nearly $14 million of public-private funding. The National Heritage Area Program is one of the Department of Interior's most cost-effective initiatives, relying on a system of public-private partnerships in which every federal dollar is matched at an average ratio of one to five. Heritage areas are funded through the National Recreation and Preservation Account and represent considerably less than 1% of the National Park Service budget. The economic, an, an economic impact study completed by Trip Umbach in 2017 found that the Cache La Poudre National Heritage Area generates an annual economic impact of $81.6 million while supporting over 1,000 jobs and generating $6.9 million in tax revenue. With federal funding for the three Colorado National Heritage Areas scheduled to sunset in 2024, we are pursuing legislative reauthorization for multiple angles. H.R. 7218, 
will provide Colo the Colorado National Heritage Areas with crucial funding stability and the opportunity to continue telling the stories that celebrate the culture and heritage of the great state of Colorado. Similarly, the National Heritage Act of, Air of 2021, H.R. 1316, will provide long-term stability to all 55 National Heritage Areas through the establishment and over oversight of a National Heritage Area system. This will standardize the designation, evaluation, and oversight of the NHAs while maintaining robust protections for private property rights. In addition to supporting H.R. 7218, we also urge you to consider supporting the National Heritage Act of 2021. Your support of H.R. 7218 will protect these nationally significant landscapes in Colorado while reaffirming a commitment to the protection of private property rights. We are grateful for your continued commitment to reauthorizing the Colorado National Heritage Areas. Thank you for the opportunity to submit my testimony. Thank you uh, for your testimony and thank you to all the witnesses again for uh, your testimony and for your patience. We, we very much appreciate it. I uh, will now proceed with member questions. Uh, members are reminded, uh, those who have stuck around, uh, that we have uh, five minutes each for questions and I'll proceed with recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to each of the witnesses for your very compelling testimony. Uh, a couple of quick questions. I don't think I'm going to take the balance of my time, but for Mr. Soros, I uh, reviewed your written testimony. Uh, I think you made some interesting points. A couple of things I wanted to follow up with. One, on page uh, five, and I think you touched on this during your oral testimony, but you kind of expound upon it in your written testimony here regarding H.R. 6589 and the argument that as I understand that you're making is that by converting the funding from discretionary to mandatory, that that is in effect, um, as you say, delegates the power of the purse away from the Congress. Uh, but I, I guess I'm trying to understand that argument because Congress still has the ability ultimately to appropriate the money as it sees fit every year during the cycle to the extent that it, the appropriators decide, I'm not on the appropriations committee, but uh, to convert the funding back from mandatory to discretionary, they have the ability to do that, this is my understanding, unless I'm wrong there, but maybe you can clarify. No, I think that's right. I'm not an appropriations expert myself, um, but just in the readings that I've had of the, making the Land and Water Conservation Fund mandatory and making the potentially making the HPF mandatory, that it, it does seem that it would put the program more on autopilot than anything else, and so it, that is a concern. I, I do think that if there is still a role for members of Congress and they can appropriate money in a given year, I think to me that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's fair. I, you know, my, uh, I think that's fair. We won't belabor it. Uh, to your point, there's an argument you could of course make about whether or not it's on autopilot, but I still, fundamentally, we're not giving away the power of the purse. I mean, the Congress sure. retains the that's ability to, to make the decisions. Um, secondly, I, you know, on page, uh, what page is this? Page seven, uh, you state at the bottom, the U.S. should also continue to be a leader in renewable and nuclear, en nuclear energy development. Price signals, not governments, should steer investment decisions. Policymakers should open access to markets, remove barriers to innovation, modernize regulations that curtail investment and uh, construction timelines. Uh, and I, I guess the question I would have is your position on oil and gas subsidies, obviously the, the tax code decisions made by the Congress over the course of many years uh, that subsidize oil and gas development. It sounds like you're kind of advocating for a more free market-based approach, and I guess I wonder if that, does that extend to oil and gas development? Uh, it does. I'd like okay. to get rid of all energy subsidies. Uh, you know, I think immediate expensing is a good tax provision that I know the oil and gas industry has taken advantage of, but I should, I think that should extend to all industries. And I, same with things like master limited partnerships. I know, you know, that, that goes to pipelines. I think it should go to renewable projects as well. So a more even tax code for sure. I appreciate that answer uh, very much. And I appreciate the, I think, the intellectual consistency on that, on that front. Last piece, because we've heard a lot today about, uh, offshore oil and gas drilling, right? And you make a recommendation in your uh, testimony, written testimony, to reform the Outer Continental Shelf Leasing Program by modernizing the five-year program. Your, the language you use here is, quote, rather than having access to offshore federal waters determined by the political whims of different administrations, Congress should reform existing laws so the Department of Interior can conduct lease sales when commercial interests exist, end quote. And I guess what I'm wondering is, I, I mean, you refer to 
sort of political whims of different administrations. You may have been in the room when I entered into the record an article from 2019. Of course, there are a wide variety of articles from that period of time in which the president, uh, President Trump at that time, uh, engaged in a series of different steps to pause or issue moratoriums on oil and gas development offshore. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, there are a bevy of Republican governors, politicians, Senator Rubio, I think, uh, introduced legislation to do a 10-year pause uh, in the Gulf, if I'm not mistaken. Governor DeSantis opposed, I'm not sure his current position today, but certainly my understanding is his position has been to have opposed offshore oil and gas uh, drilling. The same with the Republican governor of Georgia, the Republican governor of South Carolina. These are Republican governors, not Democratic governors. Uh, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get at is I assume when you make this recommendation, you're, it's, it's, it's inclusive of politicians of all political stripes, is, or am I mistaking your view? No, I think that's right. I think it needs to be inclusive of politicians of all political stripes. I think it, you need to take into consideration the desires of the communities that would be impacted, both from an economic standpoint, but from an environmental standpoint as well. And I think there's been opportunities where, you know, two Democratic senators, uh, Tim Kaine and Mark Warner, back in, I think, 2013, introduced legislation for offshore drilling, uh, so long as 50% of the revenues went to the state of Virginia and to the Atlantic state. So I understand that these things can change, and I think that should be a more collaborative process between the federal government and the Department of Interior, as well as with these uh, state agencies as, and, and local governments. Thank you. I see my time has expired. I will just simply close by saying uh, I appreciate your testimony and uh, all of the witnesses today. I do think that that clarity is important because we've heard a lot today uh, from my, my uh, good friends on the other side of the aisle about the decisions made by the Biden administration regarding offshore oil and gas development. And I just, I would hope, I'm sure they have not forgotten, but you know, uh, for uh, posterity, I would hope they would remember uh, that it wasn't too long ago when we had a Republican president uh, who uh, you know, had engaged in a more, or rather had implemented a moratorium on offshore oil and gas development. And we still today have Republican governors and Republican members of Congress who vociferously oppose any oil and gas offshore development. And so I recognize some of my friends have a different view, uh, but would hope they recognize that that is a active debate within their own party. And with that, uh, I would yield the balance of my time. All right. And Yielded the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you are correct. At least from this Republican standpoint, we are struggling with the uh, current president's uh, policies towards energy production, but I think more importantly, the people that we serve are struggling with the expense of that as a function of going to the gas pump every week. And uh, Mr. Loris, we're kind of monopolizing your time, but I have a question for you as well, and it has to do with that. In 2020, then candidate uh, Biden, can candidate Biden famously promised to end all drilling on federal lands and waters. And just two months ago, the full committee chairman uh, of this committee, Natural Resources, Chairman Gahalva, issued a statement calling the Biden administration's proposal lease sale disastrous and saying that offshore oil and gas leasing was, quote, incompatible with climate science, with federal law, and with President Biden's own ambitious emissions goals. So that's the, that's the point of view, at least from those two vantage points. And so my, my question to you is, if, if they were successful, uh, as President Biden or Chairman Grohal were successful with what they apparently want to do, which is, is stop efforts of offshore oil and gas development, what then happens to the historic preservation fund that we've been talking about today as a financing vehicle to pay for some of this new legislation? Yeah, the, the revenues would obviously decline. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, I think in your opening remarks that the you know, lease sales and these bonus bids can collect hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, the state of New Mexico on federal land uh, you know, collected over a billion dollars one year. So, I mean, th this is a lot of money, not just for programs like HPF, but for the Land and Water Conservation Fund for tackling the deferred maintenance backlog. And until that link is broken, the reality is, that, you know, these energy decisions that are being made by the administration dramatically affect bonus bids, lease sale revenues coming in, as well as royalty revenues if this path continues down a process where we're restricting development onshore and offshore. So as we follow up to that, as we are, are I will use the word forced, to depend more on sources from places like Russia, 
uh, or, or any nation outside of America. Can you compare and contrast the issue of emissions, the impact on the environmental side of things, on production domestically in the U.S. versus where we may have to import uh, in order to sustain our needs? Yeah, I think that's a critical point is that, you know, these decisions aren't going to stop the consumption of oil. Uh, we're going to be using gasoline uh, as a transportation fuel well into the future. And so it's going to shift production potentially to more private lands as we're seeing in the United States and places like Texas, but also uh, overseas. They're going to make up that gap because the reality is people can't just move away from driving their cars and going from work to school, wherever the case may be. Some people can bike, some people can take public transportation, but we're going to be using oil as a transportation fuel source for a while. Therefore, a lot of the emissions savings uh, that we're getting from these decisions uh, are simply going to offshore the emissions and the pollution to countries that have worse environmental standards than the United States. So as a, as a follow up to that, you included in your testimony a number of recommendations having to do with regulations. Uh, to streamline America's energy potential. Uh, the Republicans have introduced six different bills this month to do what we believe was just that. Can you just talk a little bit further about your ideas for enhancing uh, American energy by reducing regulations and what the effect that would have uh, back on the historic uh, preservation fund? Yeah, I think the, the most critical is modernizing the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA. I mean, th this is a law that was well-intentioned, served a very good purpose, but has now become a tool to uh, block uh, a number of different projects, whether that is offshore oil and gas development, but also new renewable projects, transmission lines, new nuclear power plants. Uh, not to mention wildfire management, we could have better forest management and, and more active uh, controlled burns through the NEPA process. So modernizing NEPA could be a, a huge tool for both the economic benefits and a lot of the environmental ad objectives I think both parties want to uh, accomplish. You. Mr. Loris, thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair recognize Mr. Ro Mr. Rosendale looks ready, but I think we might have a Democrat in the queue here. Do we have, oh, oh Mr. great. Chair? Uh, Madam Chair, of course. Uh, the chair recognizes Representative uh, Lazar Fernandez for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Nagus. And I also want to extend my thanks to the witnesses who have been incredibly patient uh, as we've had to um, postpone the hearings for these very important votes, though. And I do appreciate their support that they've expressed about what we are voting on uh, with regards to supporting the people of Ukraine. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you a few questions, Chairman Keone, um, uh Franklin, uh, especially because to try to focus on the actual context of the bill and of the Historic Preservation Fund and the importance of, of making sure we fund it. So, you, we've seen that number of TIPOs rise over the years, uh, and you set that out so, um, you know, so, in such a succinct way, um, because you actually had us think about what what does it really mean when you are trying to um, get the work done that's needed, right? Um, and the fact that we have more TIPOs is a great thing, right? It's exciting. It's a testament to the tribes expressing their sovereignty. Um, I know tribes over and over again, their desire to make sure that they are able to protect their patrimony, that they are able to protect their culture is like paramount. Um, and so this is really exciting that there's more TIPOs, right? It's really important. But what we've seen this incline, it, it, you know, uh, this increase in TIPOs, we've also seen that there's been no increase in the funding available except for this one time in 2022. And I think your testimony about the one TIPO that had three employees, it got 3,400 consultation requests. And even though it only gets $75,000 of funding makes the point, um, the Historic Preservation Fund is underfunded, and we can't expect a TIPO office to respond to 13 consultation requests a day with $75,000 of funding. And as this bill shows, it doesn't need to be that way. But Mr. Chairman, could you maybe describe how much additional funding would the TIPO you mentioned need, or perhaps your tribe and your TIPO need to truly fulfill your duties? 
Yes, uh, absolutely. And, uh, and and thank you, my friend, for uh, for asking those uh, tough questions. Um, yeah, you know, uh, seventy five thousand dollars on average for funding is just uh, it's just. I, I think that tribes, you know, especially TIPO tribes, but keeping in mind that not every tribe has a TIPO. But uh, for those of us that do and those of us that are, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, my own tribe, that's 75,000 is the average. So let's look at my own tribe, the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians. We got about $45,000 to fund our TIPO program, you know, and, uh, and it just barely scratches the surface. And for one, we live in Northern California where we could sell like two redwood trees and pay for an entire county in other states, right? <laughs> and it's just, you know, uh, and and the, the cost of living is super expensive. And we all know whether it's healthcare or it's uh, historic preservation uh, or, or anything else in Indian country, uh, we have issues with re retention uh, uh, of, of new employees and, and keeping the current ones and, and, uh, and retaining ones that we have. And, uh, and it just becomes nightmarish, um, for that tribe and trying to put three people and, and, and one of them, you know, in each, each position having a level of expertise and not just, you know, what we like to call an in Indian country, uh, a traditional PhD, right. You know, like my elders have, but, but also, um, an expertise and a knowledge of Section 106 and historic preservation laws, and the aforementioned NEPA as well. You know, we've got uh, we've got some colleges that are out there um, that uh, you know, and in, in particular, an amazing one in Montana uh, the, the, the is they're doing uh, TIPO um, uh, classes that folks can come out and get a degree in. Uh, so then somebody comes out of Salish Kootenai College with a degree, a tribal college with a degree in how to be a TIPO, how do you pay him with $75,000? You know, I mean, geez, so, so yeah, you know, triple that funding, you know, um, and, and, and in every comment, because we love the shippos that we work with and we love Nick Shippo and all they do for shippos too, but pull them up by the bootstraps as well. Between the two of us, the need is significant. The amount of funding that we get is, um, is, you know, not respectful. Thank you for it. I want to ask a real quick question. Is increasing funding for TIPO also important for you guys to get the tribal infrastructure uh, uh, built that you have? Yeah, 100%. Not just for our infrastructure, but the infrastructure projects around and on our ancestral lands too. If you look at both of those projects, then the need for funding for TIPOs to quickly and efficiently respond to the thousands of requests that we get and, and even more coming, right, with, with infrastructure bills uh, and funding that's coming down the pipe. Um, we need that funding. We need it bad. And, you know, we don't want to be a bottleneck. Let somebody else do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman Nagus, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, gentlelady's time has expired. Chair recognizes Mr. Rosendale for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Falcher, for putting this uh, committee hearing together. I thank all the witnesses who are with us today to testify on the legislation before the subcommittee. One of the bills that stands out the most to me today is H.R. 6589, which would make significant changes to how the Historic Preservation Fund receives its capital. Um, energy production and the backlog of maintenance on our national parks, specifically Glacier and, and Yellowstone National Park, which are located in Montana, and the utilization of that LWCF that, that depends upon those same funds are very important to me and the Montanans that I represent. Uh, when the uh, HPF, just like the Land, Water, and Conservation Fund, primarily receives funding from the Outer Continental Shelf oil and gas revenues. So they would be competing interest. And when the administration pauses these leases and makes it more difficult to utilize America's vast array of natural resources, actually it hurts the conservation efforts. So Mr. Loris, can you expand on how natural resource development actually helps promote conservation? Yeah, I think it helps promote conservation in a, a number of different ways. You know, the programs you all mentioned uh, depend on revenues from energy production on federal lands, whether it's the Historic Preservation Fund, uh, LWCF, tackling the maintenance deferred backlog at, at America's national parks, which has become a, a very significant problem. Uh, 
all of those things depend on revenues collected by the federal government, not to mention all of the state programs. There's a, a number of state programs. Uh, they receive money too, and they can spend that money on their own conservation efforts, whether it's coastal uh, restoration or um, state conservation programs. So this, this provides an additional pot of money uh, to provide for all of those uh, different types of conservation and, and preservation programs. And, and most of those conservation efforts and, and programs, would you say that they are able to uh, use this as a multiplier to get other funds as well to, to go ahead and, and take care of those efforts? Absolutely. I think that's one of the values of the way the Historic Preservation Fund is set up, for instance. It, it, you know, it's a competitive grant program, for instance, that allows for state and, and local interest buy-in. Uh, it doesn't just have the federal taxpayer or federal revenues coming in, you know, paying for everything. This is something that requires collaboration among a, a bunch of different stakeholders, you know, these federal receipts and federal agencies as well as state agencies and then local communities. Thank you. So what are the unintended consequences of prohibiting domestic resource development? I think there's a, a, a lot of economic and environmental unintended consequences. Obviously, there's the, the lost investment, the lost job creation, uh, reduced energy supplies domestically, shifting those decisions offshore to countries with environmental standards that aren't as rigorous as the United States uh, is going to result in uh, a lot of the emissions reductions estimates are going to be negated. If not, they might potentially be even higher. Uh, not to mention, you know, the, I think the more we export Things like liquefied natural gas, it's cleaner from an emission standpoint and from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint than pup piped Russian gas. Uh, so the more we can produce here and export to the rest of the world, there's also economic and environmental benefits as, as well. Thank you. And, and I'm sure that you've talked to the businesses and business or industry when they make these types of investments. Uh, they need predictability in the process. I mean, we're talking about massive investments, billions of dollars when they when they enter into these uh, lease agreements. Um, they have to additionally, they've got a fiduciary responsibility to their investors to make sure that they can get a return on those. And the markets continue to react negatively to the uncertainty of oil and gas development that's going on right now. And unfortunately, it's been hurting those on the lower end of the income scale the most because they end up suffering that burden of paying to put gasoline in their car or heat in their home. Additionally, we're starting to get forecasts for increased food costs as we move into the fall uh, because of the tremendous added expense to our agricultural community, our farmers, our ranchers, and the ability for them to uh, produce the, the food. But I'm glad that also you touched on the environmental standards that we have here that are so much higher than the other places that would produce this energy. So when uninformed people picture an oil rig, uh, they usually think of a large, dirty structure in the middle of the ocean spewing out dirty water and, and oil. Uh, could you please describe the actual habitat around a typical offshore oil rig here in the United States? Yeah, well, they, they actually serve as, uh, you know, reefs for uh, fish. I mean, that there's a rigs to reef program when, when they're finished, you can chop them in half and create these artificial reefs for coastal uh, wildlife and, and fish and all sorts of uh, sea Creatures And so each rig itself has, I think, the last time I checked was 12,000 to 14,000 different type of fish that use this as a natural habitat, which is great for uh, recreation purposes as well. It, it actually attracts divers to come to these communities uh, to, to scuba and snorkel. And so I think that's one thing that often is mischaracterized as the recreation communities in the Gulf Coast are in tension with the offshore energy producers, and that's not actually the case. They understand that there's this symbiotic relationship between energy production, travel, and tourism, um, and, and all of the seafood and, and uh, you know, t uh, travel and food industries that are so robust down there. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Loris. And Mr. Chair, I would yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Stopper for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and uh, uh, thanks for allowing me to uh, uh, put forth some questions, and I appreciate the panel's uh, um, expertise and their uh, witness testimony. Uh, Mr. Loris, as you rightly pointed out in your testimony, the HPF finances a variety of important conservation projects related to noble causes like uh, African-American civil rights and HBCUs. 
And, and I'd like to set the record straight with some yes or no questions. Can we continue to fund these important programs if we don't issue oil, any new oil and gas leases like what President Biden has done throughout his entire term? Not the way the law currently states. Can we fund historic preservation fund programs in the long term if we don't update the five-year offshore leasing plan, which the Biden administration is woefully behind on? No. Do you think it makes sense for somebody to claim that they support the Historic Preservation Fund while simultaneously advocating for the Biden administration to cut off the very revenues that finance the HPF? I think it's challenging to do so, yeah. So if a member of Congress supports the HPF and wants to ensure its solvency, what policy options would you recommend they consider, Mr. Loris, to guarantee the offshore oil and gas revenues currently going into the fund remain in place in the long term? Yeah, I mean, the first is to conduct the lease sales. Uh, you know, if the, there, again, is interest among uh, companies to explore and extract those resources, and it's something that those states and communities want, it seems like a, a no-brainer to continue with those lease sales and, and set that those revenues from bonus bids and revenues as the extraction and production continues to occur uh, for these conservation programs like HPF. And how many offshore leases has this administration put forth? Zero. The Biden administration has not issued a single new lease for gas or oil on federal lands or in federal waters since the beginning of this administration. Well, this obviously has implications for the Historic Preservation Fund. Can you also talk about what effect this will have on the solvency of other conservation programs that rely on energy revenues, such as the Land and Water Conservation Fund? Yeah, I, and I think that they either have or um, for onshore have, have issued a lease um, it's 80% less than I think what uh, was initially intended, so it's a much smaller size. Um, but that, ha having said that, you know, again, this is for the Historic Preservation Fund, for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, for maintenance at our national parks. Uh, the less we lease uh, and uh, allow for permitting on federal lands and federal waters, fewer receipts are going to come into these funds. And how do you, how would you, how do you understand that that the the makeup and the reduction? Um, in revenues will be made. How, how do we make up for the reduction in revenues? Well, the uh, HR uh, 6589 would turn to the Treasury. So in effect, it would be you know, the taxpayers uh, should these programs, um, should a bill like that pass um, or should these programs um, become insolvent because there's no revenues from federal receipts from energy production, it would likely turn to the taxpayers. Would, it, uh, would you say uh, it would be under mandatory spending then? For this bill, yes. Do you know if there's a pay for yet in the mandatory spending? I don't. Ridge? Okay. So I want to share with you, uh, you're exactly right. Um, I had the privilege of going uh, on the Appomattox, uh, the Shell oil platform just last week to see uh, how environmentally friendly they are extracting oil. Uh, and I spoke to the workers uh, I saw the crystal clear blue water uh, near the platform. In fact, we saw a school of dolphins uh, when we were there. It is incredibly important, and I think that we need to get uh, Joe Biden and his administration on the American side of energy and minerals. And when we do that, we can, we can uh, bring revenue to these uh, funds that do great things uh, for our society, our citizens, and our communities. Uh, and with that, Mr. Would, Chair, would the gentleman yield? I'm will. just just because I know you visited one of these sites recently, Mr. Loris. I don't know if you were here for his testimony. Or I think he talked about people scuba diving around these uh, sites. Were there? Did you see people scuba diving around? Not them? not on the Appomattox. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you to the witnesses, all of the witnesses, uh, and Mr. Loris. My apologies because I think I. Uh, mispronounced your name uh, when I was posing my questions to you. But uh, I know Mr. Loris got the bulk of the questions, but to every one of the witnesses, we very much appreciate, uh, as uh, was said by Mr. Stauber, your expertise 
and your willingness to participate in the democratic process and testify in front of this committee, uh, this subcommittee rather, on the important bills that we're considering today. So we appreciate your patience uh, and uh, appreciate you appearing today. Uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3, subparagraph O, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. Again, want to thank all the members of the committee uh, and the ranking member in particular for uh, his courtesy. And if there's no further business without objection, subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>